I have this Austin Matthews theory that I want to kick around with you and get your read on it because people are going to start to sweat as he plays more and more games down the stretch of the season. But here's the reason why they're sweating is because he's far and away the team's most important player. Like it's without a shadow of a doubt. He's got 62 goals. And I know that that sounds obvious, but I don't know if uh, let's say uh, Florida fans, if they exist beyond, you know, 500 of them are like, really nervous about Barkov finishing the rest of the season, right? Like if there's major conversations in Florida going, uh, you know, they got to make sure Barkov is rested for the postseason, or if they're doing that in Tampa with Kucherov, or if they're doing that in Boston with Pasternak, I do feel like it is a bit of a Toronto centric thing, but maybe part of that is who we are in terms of doom casting, who we are in terms of nervousness for the playoffs, who we are in terms of having had Kawhi Leonard in the city where load management becomes of even more, more import. But another part of it, I think is and sorry for going so long, but that we've seen Austin Matthews achieve incredible statistical heights. And even as he's doing this, we're a little numb to it. And I, like last night I went to bed and this morning I woke up kind of thinking about it as weird as it is to say, as much as every other hockey fan base would say, I'm insane for saying this. I actually think he's underappreciated in this market. I think that people have, yeah, I think people it's become so automatic. Yeah. It's like, I remember, remember when they got Kessel and Kessel would score 30 or 32 or and it was 100%. a huge deal. Like I, I was covering all those seasons and it was, we, we did features about how he shot the puck and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And whoa, wow, you know, Kessel's got 37 goals. I mean, Matthews has 37 goals by halfway through the season. Like what he's doing is just, Matthews is one of the best goal scorers in the history of the game. Yeah. He just is. Like it's it's it I, I tweeted this yesterday before the game. He's six goals from having the most even strength goals in Leafs history. Now he's five because he scored another one yesterday. He's five goals from having the most even strength goals in franchise history for a franchise that's over a hundred years old and he's twenty six years old. Yep. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't like it seems impossible. So I think he's now what, sixty off of Sundin all time too? Yep. Okay. So Yeah, the, he can get there next year. He'd like Easily. Yeah. Oh, n- Easily. With, without a doubt. Okay. So, and uh, I, even Alex Ovechkin didn't have two 60 goal seasons, which is crazy to think about, but Matthews already has that done. <laughs> He's already accomplished something that Alex Ovechkin, the person who everyone tells me is the greatest goal scorer of all time. And it's not up for debate. And so I, I'm not allowed to weigh in on that debate. Um, that that's already signed, sealed, delivered. It's done. Who cares? Era adjustment, all this stuff, different stuff, but that Matthews has already accomplished this twice. Um, I think that there's two other things at play here too, with the, with the non Matthews credit that he gets. One is that he's in the same era as Connor McDavid, who creates his offense in a more spectacular fashion, right? Like Matthews versus McDavid. When you're watching the two of them, Matthews, when you're trying to compare, it's, it's not really a comparison, right? It, it just isn't. Even though Matthews is brilliant, McDavid is just a whole other entity. And the way Matt McDavid can create and transition and just blow by people and make everyone look silly is just more aesthetically pleasing. We're like, oh, we get this. You're creating this. You're driving all of this. Matthews is at Marner. Matthews is a finisher, a pure finisher, who's elite defensively, does all this stuff. But when we're looking at the two, I feel like we diminish Matthews because he doesn't create the offense in the same way as his you know, contemporary. And two is that stuff that you're talking about where he's six even strength goals off of being the franchise leader. I genuinely think that there is like an understated resentment to Matthews for that, that like he's not celebrated in the same way as those greats because he hasn't done it in the postseason. You know, like people are reluctant to be like, damn, he's having one of the best seasons of all time. Damn, he's having one of the greatest statistical years because they don't want him to be ahead of some of those other guys. Like they don't want him to jump Matt Sundin when he's won one playoff series and hasn't been the same producer in the playoff season. They don't want him to jump the mythology of Sittler and Gilmore. You know what I mean? Like there's part of it is. I don't know if he can, right? Like I think he, he, he needs a run. He that, needs that's to, it. you know, they need three, four rounds at least once, you know, like the Sundin teams, they didn't win at all, but they nope. just, they put it all on the line and, and went deep a few times and, you know, there's a whole generation of the fan base that looks back so fondly on those years, you know, yeah. 02, 03, um, that, 
this group doesn't have, like this group right now is just known as underachievers. You know, they're almost, they're almost historically underachieving. You know, the number of, the number of teams that have gone out in the first round this many times in a row, and I know they won around last year, but the number of times a team this good has disappointed this many times in a row. I mean, it's, they're, they're right up there with yeah. some of the most historically disappointing teams. You know, they're talked about in the same vein as, those Ovechkin Capitals teams that, I mean, Ovechkin didn't win. I think he, what was he 33 when he won, you know, it was, yeah. a, it was a long, long road of disappointment and he played with a lot of different players. And, you know, if, if Washington had never broken through, that's all anyone would talk about with Ovechkin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, so. uh, I, I completely agree. Even the, the San Jose Sharks teams that always fell flat, yes. at least they won multiple playoff rounds, right? At least they were they went to the final, yeah, you know, they, they got, they yeah. were in a cup. They lost to Sidney Crosby and they ran out of gas. Like they, they at least had some moments. The Leafs have yet to have that. So, so you understand what I'm saying here because uh, like I'm kind of searching for it, but yeah, there is like a feeling, I think underlying feeling from fa- I would say it's probably older fans. I'm not as connected to the Gen Z group or younger Leaf fans that don't aren't tied to kind of the history of the franchise as much. Um, I know I would certainly, if I didn't have the trauma of being a Leafs fan for, you know, uh, three decades that I would probably feel differently about it too, but it's almost like a, Hey, you gotta, you're getting all these things you're getting, you're having all these accomplishments, but without the stuff that matters the most. And so the older fans are kind of like, yeah, sure. Great. But when you watch it, it's like, no, it really is. It's unbelievable what we're seeing here. And I I don't think that we appreciate it enough. I I just don't know how you can check into that mentality when the the other stuff is hanging over it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I guess the only way you can is if you're confident that at some point there's going to be a breakthrough. But I think, you know, what you're talking about off the top about the psyche of Leafs fans, like there's not a lot of... It's not a lot of confidence. And I see it on social media every single game because I'm always posting stuff about, you know, Matthews is doing this thing that's never been done before, or he's the first player since Lemieux to do X, Y, Z. And the replies, the the reply guys are often, you know, and I don't want to be ageist, but, you know, you you get Leafs fans who are my age or older and they're saying, yeah, but what about the playoffs? Mm-hmm. And they're saying that all season. They're saying that in October. They're saying it now, you know, and that's one of the hard things for this group is that the only thing that matters is what happens in, in April. Yeah. No, I think that's actually the fan base age divide is that if you're a younger fan, you're like, this is unbelievable. We can't believe we have this guy. We've just been kind of unlucky. And if you're an older fan, you're like, God, these guys love the cookies in the regular season and they accomplish a lot and who cares because they've never done it when the hockey gets harder. <laughs> and so you get that reaction to the Matthew stuff. I just, I, I will, I will tell you this. I'm being very honest. I am a huge Austin Matthews fan. I get a lot of joy out of his goal scoring. Um, he is already one of my favorite Maple Leafs of all time. But even when you say that stuff, like when you go, he's five even strength goals off of it. When he's 60 away where he's going to pass Matt Sundin and what Matthews is what now? 26. Yeah. So in his age, yeah. 27 season, he's going to pass Matt Sundin. Something mm-hmm. about it makes me not feel great. You know, like something about it makes me go like, Oh, I kind of hope he doesn't like, I hope he gets 59 goals next year. You know, like I, I, I it's a weird thing. It's a very, very strange thing. And I, I think it, I think it takes away from his greatness and his brilliance. And just like last night I'm watching him and even that empty net goal that he, uh, that he makes, it's like, he's the one that breaks up the play. He makes a beautiful play with his stick. He's an awesome defensive player and he just rips it down the ice. And my brain went to like automatically, Oh, there's another empty netter for him. That's good. He's getting closer to 70. It's like, no, that was a spectacular play. He is a spectacular player. His line is dominating. Max Domi. We spend so much time talking about like Max Domi's turned it around. Max Domi's first. It's like he plays with Austin Matthews. Tyler Bertuzzi has turned it around. He's done so much better. It's like he's playing with Austin Matthews more. That's the connector here. This guy is not getting any credit for elevating those around him. He doesn't get as nearly enough credit for how good he is defensively, how much he dominates five on five, how great he is with his stick. I saw Mike Kelly tweeted this yesterday. Hold on. Let me pull it up. He's, he won nine puck battles. And I do think the puck battle stat is a little, uh, you know, subjective. Do It's a he's little so good with his stick. Like yeah. it just like, it's incredible what he can do. That's and what I mean. He, kinda, he uses it like a pool cue or something. And he's, 
he's tapping guys and you know I don't even know what he's doing half the time it's amazing how he creates turnovers he's sixth in the league with 223 puck battles won this season again take that stat with a grain of salt but I do think that it's indicative of how good he is at breaking up plays stealing pucks and and winning them and uh, just because he's not a huge physical player where he's bowling people over all the time I don't think again he gets credit for that I just he is just an unbelievable player. And well, he could win the Selkie. Yeah. I mean, when has there been a guy who's the top goal scorer? I think we, I think he's 10 ahead of the next best goal scorer yeah. and win the Selkie. Like, I don't think that's ever happened. Yeah. He's a, there's, there's not really a parallel for him. Like, who do you even compare to historically? Who, who's, who's been a Selkie-level center who could score goals like Ovechkin? Like, Ovechkin is a one-way machine. Well, yeah. But that's not what Matthews is at all. Yeah, no one, no one is that. Um, I would say that like Datsuk was an elite offensive player, like as dangerous as they come, who was also the the top of the top when it came to defensive hockey. So I would say like the closest thing to him is Datsuk, right? Like in the modern. Well, I think it's it's more like Mario or something, or I don't know, maybe Joe Sakic, or I'm trying to think like a guy with a shot who can just create goals uh, he Matthews is his own thing and yeah. if they had had any playoff success you know if they had been to the second round two or three times and been to the third round once yeah I think you're right I think they would, he would be talked about a lot differently in the city yeah and he still is beloved like you walk around the oh, streets in my neighborhood and all you know all the kids have Matthews jerseys and like he's you know he's a legend but you know he, he signed that four-year extension and like this is the window because if it falls apart or the team's not competitive I don't know Again, like, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to be a lifetime leaf. I mean, obviously they should try and make that happen, but if they can't get over the hump here, like this, these next three, four years, he needs to, the whole group needs to break through. No, I think that's totally it. Is the, the thing that's going to determine whether he's a lifelong leaf or not is whether he wins. I, I think that if they continue to struggle and have brutal outs in the postseason, it's just not going to be fun to be a Leafs fan. And eventually... He is going to say, why am I here? Uh, I can make more money elsewhere because of taxation. Um, I can live down in the States and get more adulation from a U.S. fan base that doesn't not, really care yeah. or know about me. And not I can try it's going to be win. hard to keep the window open for yeah. like another six or seven years, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you trade your picks like at some point, you know, like it, it, kudos to Tampa for keeping it going this year. But. You know, lots of teams end up like, you know, Chicago and San Jose where you just can't do it forever. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like the. it would be very unusual if the Leafs can keep the contention window open Matthew's entire career and he stays here. Anyway. I mean, maybe they can, but it's going to be hard. Yeah. A anyway, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to split the atom here or that this is some extremely nuanced take, but I, I think that he probably suffers the most out of any athlete that I can remember in this city from carrying the ghosts of the Leafs past. And again, he owns mm -hmm. some of that blame because he hasn't performed in game sevens, right? He, he did go stretches like in that Florida series where he didn't score goals or in the Montreal series where it felt like he was snake bit and shied away from it as well, where he gets shut down by Deharnay and you go, this shouldn't happen. You're supposed to elevate and dominate at this point. But like you said, Matt Sundin never won Stanley Cups. Yes, he made playoff runs, but who cares? You know, like when did that become the marker? It's always been, it's 1967. It was never 2003, which was like the playoff series win one, right? No one ever chanted that at people. It's 67 because you're there to win Stanley Cups. And all of these other guys that get shoved in a Leafs lore this way by every fan of every ilk, Matthews is the first guy where it's like, no, this is genuinely the best Toronto Maple Leaf ever without a shadow of a doubt. Like no questions, no ifs, ands, buts about it. Even without the playoff success, he is the most talented guy. Maybe you can't say the best because yeah, generational, whatever, and guys won cups, but man, Matthews just the, the lack of be, the lack of just pure love that he gets from, I think guys that are closest to my age and older is a little bit insane. It really is. It's a little bit insane. And I think that, yeah, that, that kind of needs to stop. It's got to be a little bit more of uh, unbelievable respect, a little bit more to uh, one of the game's, yeah, greatest players of his generation. Uh, okay, so you heard my theory on Matthews. I brought it up on the show, so I'm not going to go long with it. But where are you at in terms of the, the chase for 70 and the belief that this is actually a really important thing for this Leafs team 
in terms of not checking out down the stretch, staying engaged and having something to play for in otherwise, well, I don't want to say meaningless games because they are chasing Florida, but more more so meaningless games. I I know, I think for Matthews getting more than 65 matters because it's going to be more than Ovechkin's ever had yeah. and it's going to be something no one has done since uh, Lemieux had 69 back in uh, 96. Um, I think that matters to him. So I think that there's, I don't think 70 is the only thing that's going to matter. I think getting to 66 is going to matter. So it's kind of like going to go in stages here, right? They've got a back-to-back against Tampa and Florida in the year. So I think if he's, if he's at 65, I think he's going to play both those games because he's going to want to get to 66. But if he, you know, if he's at 66 or 67 and it's unlikely he can get to 70, maybe he does rest one of those games. Mm. I mean, I think all you're talking about is does he miss one game? Like, I don't think they're going to sit him for multiple games. Do they dial back his ice time a little bit in some of these games? But on the flip side to what you're talking to, I think if you're Sheldon Keefe, you use this. You use this yeah. as a way to say these games mean something and let's play with some emotion and let, let's play like we care about each other. Let's play like we want to do this for Matthews. We want to help him get to, you know, he's doing something really historic right now. Let's get behind that as a team. And I think they're doing that. You know, I think that the, I think everybody in that room is thinking about and talking about, and I mean, the media is going in the room and talking about it everywhere they go. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're getting behind that. And Matthews is a quiet guy, but he's a leader in that dressing room. And he has, tons and tons of respect and tons of friends in that dressing room. And, you know, so I think it makes sense to use it as kind of a rallying point. It's not to say that, you know, that the playoffs aren't what really matters, but I think what Sheldon Keefe wants to do is the stuff we were talking about last week. He wants to make this matter and keep them engaged and keep them ready as opposed to just sleepwalking into the playoffs and trying to flip a switch, which they've tried to do in the past and it's burned them. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you, uh, so I, I think Keith did a really good job burning that bullet um, uh, a week ago where he had, what was, what was the quote exactly? It was that the leaders weren't mature. It was a very immature hockey game that they yeah. played. Against um, Jersey. Yeah. yeah. And it seemed this, the team seems to have responded since then again, like he, they kind of went to sleep in the third period yesterday, but they still got out of there with a win and they were really good. Their starts have been better. Um, a lot of things are clicking for them despite being down some defensemen and a couple of really important forwards. Like, yeah, they're down five important pieces in that game against the Panthers and they totally outclassed them through the first two periods. Um, he had some stuff yesterday though, where he's playing some of the young guys in big spots or he was playing Mm -hmm. even Ryan Reeves in big spots. And afterwards Mm -hmm. he talked about it and said that that's kind of development. Do you, do you like him using this time as development? Like, do you like him doing that stuff? Yeah, you're up 5-1, yeah. right? I think he needs to know, like, can he go into the playoffs with a kid line like that and have to play them in, mm-hmm. in moments? Like, that's because you're not going to be able to shelter that line when you're on the road in the playoffs against the Boston or a Florida. So what can they give him? Like, can – obviously, they're not going to be as defensively sound as Matthews or, or Camp or Tavares, but can you play them – you know, they didn't play a lot. You know, uh, everyone's talking about the that the kid line as the third line. They were they were, they were the fourth line last night. Mm-hmm. Like they were they were they played like eight minutes together or something. So well, I think what keeps trying to see is like, can he trust them in eight minutes? Can he play Robertson, Nyes, Holmberg? Um, you know, and, and you, you've got guys coming back, and Marner's coming back soon th- this week. I think he's back I don't know tomorrow. when you're. Uh, I, I think so, but mm-hmm. it'll depend. I mean, we'll see if he's on the ice for, for practice today. Uh, they're practicing, I think, at noon. Um, I don't know if Jan Kraus can be back or not, but let's say they both come back. You're going to have some tough decisions on who comes out. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to sit. You're not going to take McMahon out. I like the way that Dewar's played. Um, you know, if they're playing Florida, probably if they're playing Boston too, I, I, with the way he's played, I think Reeves probably is in the playoff lineup, right? So... All of a sudden, you're looking at like who who are you taking out? It's going to be a tough call, and I think that that's part of what Keith wants to see is you play him in tough situations against good players, and who plays well, and who buckles, and who makes mistakes. Mm-hmm. And we saw some of that last night. Who are you taking out? Starts tomorrow. <laughs> if it if there's two, I mean, you know me. Like I, I think I would take Reeves out, but I mean he's playing well, so. Uh-huh. Um, I think you got. I think I take Robertson out, which is is a harder case to make after he, you know, creates the offense he did yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just worried about him giving it back the other way. 
I think Robertson and Reeves is probably who I would take out. Okay. You know, so I haven't done I haven't done the like what are all the lines in my head yet, but yeah. you know that's going to be part of it. No, yeah, and, and we'll end up doing that. But yeah, I think you're right in terms of the first two guys that are out are those two guys. The question is, is it going to be two guys? Because it's been quiet on the Arncroft front. Yeah, I don't know. And he's had multiple injuries, I think, to the same hand. So, you know, it's not like it's just one thing that's that's taken him out. Yeah. He he might be a guy that's not ready. And again, I don't know for sure. The Leafs have been really tight-lipped about injuries lately, uh-huh. which I think is what that Marner quote was from on the, on the weekend about yeah. people guessing what his injury was. Uh, you know, it could be a situation where Jan Kroc doesn't come in until game two, game three, game four, and... You know, it's only one player coming out. And in that case, I think it would probably be Robertson. Um, but it's certainly going to be a conversation with the uh, the front office. And, and who knows? There's still eight games. I mean, there still could be someone else who gets hurt here. So, um, you know, we'll see. Um, here's what I would say. If it's just down to one and it's between Robertson and Reeves, I don't really think it matters. <laughs> I don't think that either guy is like, they're both such heavily flawed players that you can, you can make a pretty strong argument for either one being out. I actually I, like, I think Reeves is probably the guy I would leave in between the two just because I love the, I love when he's doing like, he starts that game yesterday with a huge hit. And then what ends up happening? Lomberg takes a penalty right after. Like they, they start to lose their mind and the other team starts scrambling and running around and trying to impose their physical identity. Like having him out there does matter. The thing that scares me a bit with Reeves is not only the foot speed and him getting trapped in his own end, that stuff, but it's that I, I, there are times and maybe it's just regular season stuff and he tightens that up come postseason. but there's been times this year where it gets later in the game and then he starts to kind of like run around and want to impose that and you yeah. go, don't do that anymore. Like they, they don't need that in this point of the game. They just need you to lock down and not take stupid penalties. And he sort of got away with one yesterday. And that scares me a bit is the Kyle Clifford itis. Yeah. The, I got to do something and I got to make this happen. I got to force that. If you could eliminate that, I think Reeves is a kind of clearly ahead of Robertson right now. But the part, the other thing is with Robertson, what he showcased yesterday is man, like this team has just not had anybody who could break a game in the postseason year over year over year. And it's the thing that I think some people keep missing when they, they talk about the team around Matthews is all of a sudden there are dudes who can finish and you just, you stack enough of those guys up and you, you start to see pucks go in the net and maybe things break differently from the Leafs just from a, even a, like a, obviously a practical standpoint, but a psychological standpoint of no more losing games, one, nothing or two, one. Well, they're the highest scoring team in the league since mm-hmm. Jan one. You know, they, uh, they're averaging over, I think, over four goals a game in the last two months. So this is like, it's, they're, they've been on fire. And it's not just Matthews and Nylander. You know, Matthews and Nylander were carrying the offense for the first three months of the season. Now it's, everybody's been filling the net. And I think, you know, that's that's definitely been something that's been lacking in the playoffs. So, yeah, I mean, I like the idea of, that's the thing with that, that I keep calling them the kid line, which probably makes me, seem old but you know like the having the young guys play together and being able to put some in mm-hmm. having Bobby McMahon able to move him up the lineup and he's scoring all of a sudden Domi and Bertuzzi are scoring mm-hmm. Camp, you know is, is looking like he's got a little bit more offense lately that that's what they need they're, they're going to need some of those greasy goals from down the lineup and there have been some post seasons where it's you look at it and it's remember last year like I, I think like the whole bottom six they got nothing like yeah. there was you know, year over like, year they had that they like there's the third and fourth line just you know the Engvalls and Mikheyev and Kerfoot and you know guys like even like Achari I think had two goals in what did they play uh 12 13 playoff games last year like they, they just they've had a lot of bottom six guys that have produced nothing in the playoffs they need they need one of those guys in a playoff series they need a McMahon to get four goals or or something like that like they need the by the committee and you know, for the last two, three months of the season, it looks like they've got enough firepower there that they can do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, two more things. One, how do you feel about the goaltending job or the the goaltending battle right now? Because I thought after the Buffalo game, I came out here yesterday and went, you know what? This is Samsonov's job now. He's He's done the better job. He looks good. Uh, let him run with six of the final nine games. And then yesterday as they were sort of melting down, I went, oh, he doesn't... 
I don't think it's decided yet. Yeah, okay, I don't think so, it's. Yeah, it's not. It's not over. I, Wall's probably going to start tomorrow, right? So that's that's what I thought now too. After that game, I went, yeah, maybe you put Wool in against Tampa. But when do you have to decide though? Because I, You're I don't fighting with yourself. Here. Yeah, but I don't yeah. think that they should wait until the final. You know, I don't think that it should be a question leading into Game One. I, I don't like. I really don't believe that's good. Well, dial it in in the last four games of the season, right? Like give give one guy three of the three of the last four. Yeah. So then I it just, just comes down to that. Close. I think it's I don't think unless unless Samson starts dominating more games. I know he's had some dominant performances, but last night wasn't it. Mm. So, but I think I don't think I I'm not ready to for sure say it's not wool for game 1. So I play him tomorrow against Tampa. Yeah, I regret but, saying it was over after the Buffalo game. I, I went, it's, it's over. <laughs> it's yeah, but it, was, but it was a spectacular performance. Like, I, I didn't get to watch yes. it live. I went and watched it without any emotion attached to it. I, like, I, I wasn't on Twitter that night. I was out. I just, I, I woke up the next mo- Sunday morning, and I rolled the tape, and I watched it, and I was like, I, I hadn't read a story. I had no idea what was going on, and I went, man, this guy was the story of the game. Like, I'm sure Matthews hitting 60 was everything, and obviously the crowd was spectacular, but... He was unbelievable. And then yes. even I went back and, you know, I watched the post game stuff and the way he was carrying himself to the media and just kind of feeling himself the way he was speaking. I went, man, this guy's back to remember when we were getting cute quotes from Samsonov last year and it was fun and he was not afraid to put himself out there from a non vulnerable personality standpoint. I went, Oh, he's returned to this now. He's, he's back. And then yeah, yesterday when they were kind of skittish against Florida, I went, oh, God, you still make me nervous. Maybe, but I just don't know if that, that will ever go away with him now because of what he did to start the season. It's just, I yeah. I feel like it's probably Samsonov, though, right? Like, yeah, it's I agree. Like it is 50, probably 40 Samsonov. Or, yeah. You know, 70, 30 or something like that, Samsonov. But I don't think it's, I don't think the battle is quite over yet. Yeah. I just, I, I was, I was, I, I declared it. I called it, and now it's like, oh, we need a recount, and I look like an idiot. I called the election too early. <laughs> you know what, though? I think I think that if you're gonna if you're gonna make a switch in a series, I think that's going fine. to Wool second probably makes more sense, right? Way like more sense. we've seen him do that, and he's gonna be ready to do it. So, you know, that's part of why I would lean towards it being Sam's out for game one. It was part of my argument for this all along. Um, anyway, I already feel proven correct on this, which I'm happy. I don't know which root for the take, but it's not bad when you get it. I said right away, this was going to be a goaltending battle, and everyone told me I was an idiot. I was like, okay. Uh, and it has been, and it's going to be a goaltending battle down the stretch. And, yeah, it's it's 60-40 still, but, yeah, it feels like it's uh, Samson off 64. I, I give Samson off more of an edge than that. I just think that like, Wool would have to play a spectacular Wednesday night and force their hand to play in the Montreal game and then just continue. I think Wool now has less margin for error than Samson off does, if that makes yep. sense. I think so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Last one. Um, Cause I haven't spoken to you since they locked up Benoit. Um, I, he was very good last he night. He really was. He was, he was. he was one of their best players last night. hundred yeah. percent. No question about it. Um, what do you think of that deal? Because most people just go, well, it's great. Cause it's cheap. Um, and you got a guy tied up, but was it necessary? Like, was he going to get that much more? Like, what is your read on this deal? Because you're a very good cap guy, contract guy. And yeah, like, I, I don't know. I thought it was kind of hard to push back on, but then I saw some people that, and I was texting with some people who were like, yeah, I don't really like it. And I was like, mm, okay. I was like, why rush to this? I was like, oh, it's fine. What, you what know, are your you thoughts? Get, you, you get the years, right? Like yeah. you get, you get the three years, you know, like he, I, I'm pretty sure it's two RFA years and one UFA year. I mean, him in two, if he keeps playing like this, him in two years, it, 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 I got it right, right? It was three years, one, three, five was the, was yeah. the contract, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Three years. You, you you buy a UFA year for like nothing. The cap's gonna, in three years. The cap's going to be pushing a hundred million, and even if he's a third pair guy making one point three, you bought a UFA year. Like if he plays like this, and he, he could play eighteen to twenty minutes, and he goes to UFA, a big physical defenseman like him, he's getting what. Three, four million. I mean, look what guys like Radko Gudis and these like third pair guys that are, you know, defensive players get. So you're making a bet that he's going to be a huge home run for you in years two and three of that contract. He's not a very old guy. I think he's 25. Mm. That's why he's still an RFA. And it it just looks baffling that Anaheim walked away from the guy because I think worst case scenario for him is that he's your number six defenseman 
Uh-huh. And for 1.35, that's fine. I mean, I guess the very worst case scenario is he's less than that. But even if you have to waive him, you know, th- th- that cap charge is almost disappears. Yeah. Almost none of it will, will be like there's there's very little downside to me. And I, I, honestly, I'm not really sure from his perspective why he signed for so long. That was my follow up question is, is like, I don't. It seems the to term me term is why it, it's a win for the Leafs sure. because it could end up being like could end up like look at the Joseph Wolk contract mm. they gave him three years he's making seven hundred eighty I think he's yeah. making nothing yeah and then he might be their starter next year yeah that so that's what you're betting on with those kind of contracts yeah it's especially tough looking at Wolves because he's older and he signed that deal and I don't know and now feels like he's going to be in a tough spot to ever really get paid in his career. You know what I mean? Like he'll make millions of dollars, but yeah, you, you look at his age and the contracts and the time and the position, I like kind of squint and say, huh, that's yeah. You might've shot yourself in the foot with that. I don't get the reason why Ben Wall would take the three years. I think it's a big win for the Leafs. Like I just, for the reasons you just said is I don't see there's zero potential for massive backfire here. Like there's no implication no, I, to I this going. That's what I mean. There's no implication to it going wrong. And, and I just don't understand why he wouldn't have walked it later and said, yeah, um, even if I don't play in the postseason, I'm a, you can't teach my size. Uh, I've clearly looked good. Um, I've played up and down the lineup and I'm a physical freak who's still young. I'll be fine. I'll end up getting more money than this. Like I, it just, yeah, the third the third year was a little strange. I guess maybe he really likes it here. Like I, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You know what it is? He wants to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's possible now with that's that nice. contract. If he, if he, yeah, it's that's that's a discount for sure. Yeah. So it's a really good contract for Trey Living. It, yeah. it really is because you know a lot of I think a lot of agents in and I haven't talked to his agent about this, so I don't know what their their thinking was. But a lot of agents would be like, hey, just like you know, go to arbitration, grind out a one year deal. You know, get to UFA because you're gonna. There's gonna be a big number there for you. Yeah. You know, look at the contracts that like Good Branson and like there's so many guys that are like him around the league that have made a lot of money to be kind of what he is. And I think that he 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 loves it here. But yeah. also that you know the development staff has worked with him a lot and mm. they see upside in this guy. And if they can get his skating up a little bit and his puck handling up a little bit, look at the reinvention to his game that Luke Shen went through the last couple of years. Mm. Get get Benoit working with some skills coaches on being able to have a better first pass and a little bit better stick handling. And you might really have something with him. Yeah. I, I love the deal. And uh, I think tree living deserves a lot of credit for this, but here's the, also, here's the part that I haven't mentioned yet. I also really love this because rewarding McMahon and Benoit with contracts before the playoff start, it's great vibes for the team. Guys are th- thrilled to see those guys get paid. Guys are thrilled to know that those guys are part of the team. You're removing some of the mercenary element with this group, you know, some of the financial, I don't want to say insecurity because that's a little uh, generous, but you know, the feelings of maybe I'm not here this year. It's no, no, no. You're a team. You guys can be around. You're a part of this. I, I like it. I just think that from a chemistry standpoint, tree played this extremely well. And I think from a like practicality and value standpoint, he nailed it too. So good job by the Leafs on these ones. Uh, James, Thanks for making time, brother. We'll talk to you next week. Yep. Thanks, JD. See you, pal.